Hi, Ann. No, it's Rob. Oh, it's Rob. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wow, Ann's on the call. Got it. Okay, well, it's just you and me so far, but you know what agents are like. Maybe they'll come a little later. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're All right. Early. And so now, oop, I just, there, I got to enlarge you full, full screen so I don't see. So if I do screen share, then that's when I can pull up the purchase yeah. agreement. Oh, yeah. there we go. I better pull up the purchase agreement first. Let's practice. I get this figured out. Yeah. Are you here? Are you in your office? Uh, yeah, I'm sitting in my office here. <laughs> cool. Perfect. It's brilliant. All right. Yeah, you can totally see it going through it. Wow. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, I'll just wait for some people to show up then. Yeah, gosh, you could always go through it with me and we can record it. <laughs> and then, next, and then, uh, and then uh, I was thinking on December 8th, if no one comes today, we'll just play your recording. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm sure someone will come. So, all right. Well, I will see you in a few minutes then. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, here we go. All right. If nobody shows up, I can do it again on December 8th if you want me to. Well, oh, I, mean, I, yeah. I, won't I won't guarantee that because that's the day before my birthday. Oh, so, really? What do you yeah, mean, so, 30? And I like making it the birthday week. Oh, right, right. <laughs> cool. Very cool, right? Yeah. Um, I don't want to be reminded how old I am, so I'll just take one day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's close to Christmas. Did you always get, you know, Christmas presents early or? 
Nah, I always felt that it got a little gypped off because sometimes like, oh, we'll just combine your gifts together and <laughs> it's like, like oh, that's not. I good. don't know. Doesn't matter. I know, right? No. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, good. Oh, we'll wait a few minutes. I mean, I had some people emailing, so hopefully. Okay. There's a lot of meetings and a lot of classes, aren't there? So, I mean, it's great that we offer everything, but people are getting, I think, a little bit um, comfortable with just, oh, I'll just watch the video and then, so, but anyway. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. And okay. if it doesn't, if nobody shows up, then I'll go do other work. Okay. Oh, there's Haley. Good. All right. Hi, Haley. Hi. Good. We're just waiting a few more minutes to see who else can come on. Perfect. I'll put my camera on in just a second. I'm just getting situated. <laughs> OK. Good. Hi, Jill. Hello there. How are you? Good. We've missed you at accountability, but I know you're now oh. in the Gorman group. So, but uh, oh. I still missed you. Oh, well, thank you. It's nice, nice to be missed. <laughs> Great. We're just going to wait a few Great. more minutes. We'll wait three more minutes until five after and then start. Is that okay? That sounds good. Okay, cool. Cool. Rob is not Ann Flaherty, but he signed in as her. That's what you're <laughs> Are we supposed to have a purchase agreement printed out? No, you don't need one. I have one. It should be on the screen share. Yeah. Um, Would it be I'll, easier I, if we did have one printed out, you think? It, 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 it's up to you. I'm just okay. going to go through, and you could make notes and say line three, fill in this line if you want to or you could print one out quick and and go okay okay they're in the drawer too haley So uh, these are two, Jill is pretty new, maybe three months, Jill, around when I started as well um, in Woodbury. And then Haley is pretty new. So two new agents, basically, Rob, so. All right. <clears throat> and you got me, I got 33 years of doing this. So um, 
I'll share with whatever I whatever I know for you. Yeah, that's what we want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, heck yeah. We'll give it another minute and get started. Okay. And you're always welcome to track me down in the office. If you ever have a question, um, I'm usually here. If you if I can ever help, just track me down. Thank you. I even fill in for associate broker for Mike once in a while. So oh, if you cool. if you're really in a pinch on a weekend or something and need an answer, be free to free to call me. Oh, cool. Oh, thanks. All right. Well, we'll get started. It's five after here. Um, so uh, we'll just start right at the very top of the purchase agreement. And please stop if there's questions along the line. Um, just stop and ask your questions and we'll go we'll go from there. So um, under the buyer's name, you'd think that would be pretty simple. It is, but there's some couple tips here I can give you is look at your pre-approval letter that you get from the lender if you're doing a finance deal. And that's how exactly how their name should be filled out. Because the lender has them in their system for pre-approval and using a middle initial, not using a middle initial. And there's been times where I've had to do a addendum or an amendment to the purchase agreement right before closing to fix names. So if you have the pre-approval letter in front of you when you're drafting the purchase agreement, fill that name in uh, under the buyers. That'll be your best bet. Um, if you're ever working with a trust um, or somebody who's in charge of a trust, you will need to fill in that as Jane Doe as trustee for the Jayon and Jane Doe trust. So if you ever have that situation, make sure you have the buyers. It's not the person signing it if it's part of a trust. It's the person as a trustee to the trust. So that part, uh, that's really the thing, two things you got to remember about buyers um, names there. Um, earnest money, um, typically I like to see 1% in there for earnest money. Um, you can put more, you've probably listened to a few of these webinars about how to put in maybe larger earnest money will help you secure an offer when you're in a multiple offer situation by having more money in there. If that's possible, that could help. So fill those lines in. And then on line seven, most of the time it's gonna be delivered to the listing broker, but occasionally you're going to have a situation where maybe it's held by a title company. I've had two of those this year where we've checked the second box and the money's to be held by land title. Um, and so you can put that in there. Um, sometimes it's held by an escrow manager. So that's the only reason you'd use the blank if it was being held someplace other than the listing broker. And then as we go down um, here, address and everything is pretty straightforward. Legal description, if you're using Instanet, it usually fills in automatically. Um, best to have the legal description in there. Uh, the um, If you really need to, it's not great to do, but you can do um, legal description to conform with above address. Um, that's something that you can do if you don't have the legal description, but with these instant nets and as fill, automatic filling out, it's usually there. Um, be careful also on that. I had, I had a property that I'm just about to close on that actually had three PIDs and three legal descriptions for the street address. So that's just something to be careful of, make sure that you got the proper legal description in there. Um, we'll skip down. Any, does anybody got any questions about the personal property section there, all the pre-written stuff? Nope. All right. It was one Great. question about TV uh, that Stillwater agents had about the TV wall mounts. I see those are included, TV wall mounts, not the TV, but the TV wall mounts for these flat screens, right? Correct. That's one thing. Good. Thanks, Megan. That was a great catch. Um, the, it's interesting that once you attach something to the house with a, a, a you know screws, bolts, or nails, it becomes real property. It's no longer personal property. So, um, point that out to your sellers. Um, point it out to your buyers because sometimes the buyers might not want the TV mounted where the seller has it, and the seller could take it. So it's sometimes a discussion you have with the listing agent as if that's going to be included or not. 
if it is not going to be included, go down to line 36 there and exclude it. Exclude the TV mounts or exclude anything that's not included with the property. Um, I'm very old school. I like everything in black and white. So if you if there's any question marks or anything that you want clarified uh, by your seller, by your buyer about what's stain, what's not stain, make sure it's in the purchase agreement and somewhere in there uh, that just helps um, fix problems or alleviate problems coming later um, down the line. Any questions there? Okay, purchase price, pretty straightforward there. Um, filling in the lines 40 through 46 about percentages of how much is gonna be financed, how much is gonna be putting down payment. Um, that's pretty straightforward to fill out. Closing dates, um, my suggestion there is to contact the listing agent when you're writing an offer and find out if there is a preferred closing date of the seller. Uh, that just makes things go a little bit smoother. Uh, maybe you can nail it right off the beginning and maybe even get a better price for your buyer if you have the right closing dates for something that might appeal to the seller. Okay. Oh, Rob, if it's okay, I'm going to ask stupid questions, stupid, not sure questions. Okay. Um, so do you, on the um, purchase price, got that, then the percentages, do you just fill out one and two because three and four are not necessary? When do you fill out three and four? Um, three and four, they're assuming a mortgage is not real common right now. There's only a okay. very few mortgages out there that are assumable. Um, okay. And then number four is a contract for deed. And well, those are blank most of the time. Most of the time. In my 33 years, I've done maybe five contract for deed sales. Okay. So usually you're going to find contract for deed sales to be on land um, or maybe a cabin that isn't financeable or something like that, something that you can't get traditional financing on, you, you would use number four, a contract for deed. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry okay. to ask such a st stupid question. That's okay. Um, make sure, here's page two, make sure the address is on every page of the purchase agreement, uh, just so that nobody ever slips a page in there that's not supposed to be in there. If you do it from the beginning, it's all, um, they all coordinate together and nobody can modify it or make a make a false purchase agreement out of it for you. Um, purchase agreement is or is not subject to financing. So unless they're paying cash, you're always going to be checking line 52 that there's some type of finance contingency. And then so you scroll down to uh, 56 and you pick out if there's going to be a first mortgage only or if there's going to be a first and second mortgage. That's what that first mortgage with subordinate financing, that's a first and second. There are some loan programs out there where you can get a 90% first mortgage and a 10% second mortgage. So you're doing 100% financing. Um, that would be that situation where you, where you would check the second box there. And then um, the fit line 57, that would deal with if you're using any type of government loan programs or grant programs like um, MHFA, where there might be some down payment assistance, um, some of those programs. I'm thinking there's an ACORN program out there that I've run into over the years that um, that's, it's a bond program and there's just some extra steps to it. Um, if you ever see that when you're representing a seller and you see that this that line is checked that this does include a grant program or bond program, call that loan officer and find out if there's gonna be any extra steps for the seller. Sometimes there's an extra inspection to make sure that all the code, the city codes are met, or there might be some type of um, extra inspection. So if you're representing a seller and that box is checked that financing does include a grant program, call the loan officer and find out any special circumstances. So you're hundred percent aware of what's going in uh, into the purchase agreement. And then down here, 60 through 63, um, those are, the different types of loan programs, most of them you're probably pr pretty familiar with. Um, 63 is the rural development, the USDA loan program. You have to get outside of the seven county metro area um, to use that program. Um, so if you um, ever run into those programs, they're great because there's very little down payment. There is no mortgage insurance to those, but that's that's what that program is. Number 63 is a program for rural properties. Uh, let's see here. Um, 
65, 66 um, amortized over no more than a period of, you know, even if your buyer's just trying to decide between a 15 and a 30 year mortgage and they haven't made that decision yet, put 30 years. They can always be 15 years because that's less than the 30, um, but that's what most of the time they're going to fill in 30 there as, as the first one. And the second line here, I see so many people write in market rate. Don't do that to your buyer. Never do that to your buyer. Put in a percentage. So even like today, interest rates are around three to three and a quarter. You could even put three and a half in there uh, as a safe thing. If you put in market rate and interest rates climb to 5%, your buyer is still obligated to purchase that property if they can qualify at 5%. So that's where market rate can screw your, or and I should, sorry, the other word, can jeopardize your buyer, um, can cause cause an undue or unforeseen financial hardship. So always right there, write in a percentage. Um, and so that if, it, if rates do go crazy before they lock in, they do have a back door to get out of the purchase agreement if so desired. That's a mistake I see a lot. And I know that it would jeopardize your buyer quite a bit. Um, getting down here to the mortgage finance contingency, um, I'm seeing most of the purchase agreements coming in checked with line 78 lately because they're multiple offers um, and they want to, that helps make their offer look strong that I can get this loan done by a certain date. If you're representing a seller, that is great to see that date in there. If you're writing an offer for a buyer and it's a multiple offer situation, Put a date in there. Talk to your loan officer and say, hey, what date can we put in here to make my buyer's um, offer look strong and fill that date in. The first the first box up here, 72, that one protects your buyer so that if they cannot get the loan by, by the closing date, their earnest money comes back to them automatically. That's the one that that's, if you're representing a buyer, you'd love to check that one because it safeguards them and that's who you're representing. But that always isn't the best box to check if you're in a multiple offer situation. You might get you might get bounced because you checked box 72 on the offer and the other uh, and the competing offer check box 78. They may go with the other offer even if they were identical and everything else. So that's my comments on that part there. Um, this written statement, if you're representing the seller, you want to keep an eye on that and watch that date. Um, that's there and getting a rip, written statement from the lender that the loan is approved. And sometimes there will be some small contingencies like we need an updated pay stub or we need um, some, some small minor form. They will still give you the, the written statement if you have those small conditions. If there's big conditions, they won't um, give that. And how that kind of works is that if the seller doesn't, or if the buyer doesn't supply this letter to the to the lender, to the buyer, or to the seller, excuse me, then it gives the opportunity for the seller to back out of this transaction. So, um, the earlier you can set that date, representing the seller, the better, so that you know that you have a done deal, um, and you're going to be moving towards closing. If you start getting past that date and you don't have a written statement. You know, might want to explain to your seller their options of canceling this transaction and moving on to another another uh, purchase agreement or somebody who's more qualified on that. Um, so that's how that part applies. Any questions there? Nope. Okay. And then we'll go down here. It's more about the written statement and what that means to to what falls into play there. Um, if it's under that written statement, if it's the seller's responsibility that they can't they can't get that loan approval, that that makes this whole thing a little bit different because it, if it's a seller either it can't make good title or hasn't done some work orders that were required and that's why we can't get that letter, it, it kind of spells out there that the date continues or that they, um, it's not the buyer's fault for not supplying this, it's the seller's fault. So that's how that part applies. Um, down here for locking the interest rate, um, most everybody picks line 117 and locking it prior to closing um, as required by the buyer's lenders. That gives your buyer the all the options that they want as far as locking in interest rate. They can do it tomorrow or they could do it three days before closing. Um, but that's that's the box that I would typically check in there. 
lender commitment to work orders, what that section applies to is really to only to FHA and VA loans because um, conventional loans, they won't call things unless it's really, really bad um, on the house as far as a repair. And a work order is a repair that's required to be done prior to closing before the, the um, bank will secure financing against it. So the big thing we run into always on this one is lead based paint. So if there's peeling paint and you have an FHA um, purchase agreement, that work or that work is going to have to be done for before closing. And how this the mechanics of lines 118 through uh, 127 work is that if you put a number in here, let's say you put $100 in here, um, then if the some repair comes back and it's $500, what happens is the seller can make the option to yes, I'll go ahead and make the difference up, up there and just take care of the work order so we close, or they could negotiate the additional costs. So if it was, you had $100 in there and there was $1,000 in there, they could negotiate who's gonna, um, how that's gonna be dealt with. If you can't come to an agreement, then the purchase agreement becomes null and void at that point. Um, so that's kind of how that the mechanics or how that paragraph affects a purchase agreement. And it's only gonna come up on FHA and VA loans because uh, they're the only ones that really require repairs. And the repairs are called by the appraiser. So when the appraiser goes out to do their appraisal on the property, they're looking for things that affect the buyer's health and safety or the future value of their property. That's the two items that they're looking for to call, call about work orders. Um, on that situation, in a multiple offer situation, I would always put zero on line 118 that that would make your offer um, more competitive. And even if you do see, um, let's say you show a house and it's got peeling paint and you think that the, there's gonna be a work order for painting the outside of the house, put, make that number low. If you put $2,000 in line 118, thinking that they want them to do $2,000 worth of paint on the outside of the house, your offer might get bounced because of that number being so high. Um, just put a small number in there and then deal with it after the appraiser has been out there to, to work with it that way. That's my recommendation on it. Um, line 127 deals that if you do have a work order, the appraiser does need to go back out and inspect it to make sure the work was done. And there's usually about a $75 or $100 reinspection fee that needs to be paid at closing for that, for that um, appraiser to go back out there. My personal feeling is that if the house isn't in financing in book condition, that it should be the seller that pays that reinspection fee. But in a competitive market, in a competitive offer, you might want to check the buyer will be responsible for that uh, reinspection fee just to make your offer competitive with um, another offer. Okay. Um, uh, line 128 here, the FHA escape clause um, it has to do with FHA financing only. And if what that says, if the house does not appraise for the purchase price um, that's in the purchase agreement, then you can be, um, the buyer can walk away from the deal. And so that protects them that they're not overpaying for a home. Um, the VA also has a similar clause that we'll get to. Conventional loans do not have this clause in there. So if you want to protect your buyer in the most in the best way, you might want to come up with your own clause here that says uh, that if the property doesn't appraise for the purchase price, the buyer can back out of it. And if you want my clause, I have it, I have it stored as a standard clause in Insta Forms or Instanet. So I just pull it out and inject it into a conventional offer when this when the buyer instructs me to. So I guess so you want to I definition of an FHA loan in like simple terms, I guess. Um, it's a federal housing administration. So it's the three and a half percent down payment loan that a lot of first time buyers use it. Um, so that's what that loan is. And the VA is for the veterans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, lender processing fees on line 140 here and one through 142 always fill a zero in there. If you leave that blank, 
um, there's going to be a fee that comes back to your seller. And I've seen a few buyers put in there um, $100 towards processing fees. That's really committing your seller to paying $100 towards closing costs. Um, if there's a zero in there, it doesn't get charged. If there's $100 in there, it will get charged. That's my experience. So if you're representing a seller, make sure it's zero. Um, and it really doesn't matter for the buyer. Um, I always put a zero in there on every purchase agreement that I write. Um, down here, 143 through 146, with a veteran's loan, a VA loan, there's um, a funding fee, that one-time funding fee that the um, that the borrower has to pay. And I believe it's, a, I think it's 3% right now. It might be less than that. I, I haven't written a VA loan in a long, long, long time. So I'd have to look, go back and look at that. But what that most buyers added on top of the loan amount. So that right here, line 145 is, it would be paid 100% by the buyer and added to the mortgage amount. That's how I see 90% of them written. Uh, there might be people, sometimes somebody asking for the seller to pay at 100%. That's just like paying closing costs of the buyers again. So it's gonna come off of the seller's bottom line. So you'll wanna, um, if, you, if, you, if, they, if they do have 100% by the seller, you might wanna contact the lender the, who gave you the pre-approval letter and find out exactly how much that amount is. And I think now I think of it, it might be less than 2%, but it's still going to be money that comes out of your seller's uh, pocket if it's if line 146 is filled out. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then here is line 148 through 155 um, is the Department of Veterans Administration or the VA's escape clause. So there is uses, says that if it doesn't appraise, then the purchaser can back out of the transaction. And so, and that's a, this is about what I copied. So lines 148 through 153, when I wrote my conventional escape clause, um, this is basically the, the, the verbiage I used right here. I just dropped out the Vet Department of Veterans Affairs out of the um, a little language of that paragraph that I had. Okay. Um, Lines 156, 157, other mortgage financing items. I really haven't used that, but I guess if there was some special circumstances with your loan um, or something that they, that they needed to do, the seller needed to do, that's where we would probably see that. Uh, contribution to buyer's closing costs here. Um, so if the, if, if the seller is going to be contributing then they're going to fill out here on line 160 or 161 a dollar amount or a percentage of the sale price that's going to be come out of the seller's pocket. So if it's 3%, just realize that when you're doing putting together your seller's net sheet, you need to show that 3% of the sales price, so a $300,000 house, there would be $9,000 coming out of their pocket at closing to be applied towards any of these items down here. Um, and it usually covers most of anything. In a situation, I've run into this a couple times and it's kind of a tricky situation. Let's say you do have $9,000 built in there for closing costs and the seller or the bank only needs 8,500 of it. There's $500 there that wasn't used. Technically, it's not supposed to be charged to the seller. The seller should only be charged the $8,500. Um, if it's not one of these items that's listed on 162 through 166. So we watch that it sometimes comes up as a stickler at closing. If you're representing a buyer and the buyer um, doesn't have, uh, or the buyer isn't using up all their closing costs, maybe a home warranty could be used to, to purchase and, or use up the rest of those closing costs that you've negotiated in the purchase agreement for them. So that's kind of what happens there. Um, down under inspections, um, the buyer elects or declines. Um, if they elect to have the property inspected, which you should recommend to all of your buyers, you don't want to be ever the one that says, oh, this house this is such a good condition. You don't need to inspect it. Never, never, never do that. Always recommend an inspection uh, to cover your butt on that. 
So then you, you would always click on 172, you'd say that this purchase agreement is contingent upon the home inspection. Now, in some of the classes that talk about getting your multiple offer inspect, um, accepted, they're talking about not making it contingent upon the um, inspection. They're just doing the inspection to um, get an idea of what the condition of the house is, and they're just going to deal with it. The only reason they'd ever back out is if something major was done. So some people are playing around with that line 172 to make their multiple offer look better in a seller's eyes. Um, so that's kind of one way you can use 172, but it, that's how it is always contingent upon the inspection. Um, just a note here, the inspector must be someone who's qualified as an inspector or a tester. And the other person who would be, if they're not a licensed inspector, would be a licensed contractor to do the inspection. Um, Uncle Joe is not an inspector. Um, they, they, they are not qualified to be an inspector, so that can't be an inspector for your buyer um, on that. So just so, so you know about that. Uh, line 179. Intrusive testing. Intrusive testing would be where they're going to take something apart in the home or do um, change the condition of the house. Um, where this one applied a lot for a while here in Woodbury and around the Twin Cities was stucco homes. Stucco homes would have mold in the walls um, and have water problems in the walls. And so testers, inspectors would have a device where they would drill a small hole in the house put a probe in there to see if there was moisture in the wall cavity. That's when you need to have intrusive testing. So that's where you would use does. 90% of the purchase agreements that I see the box does not um, is the box that's checked. So they don't, you can't take things apart. You can't go behind a wall to see what's going on. You just have to do a surface inspection. So that's what intrusive versus non-intrusive testing or inspections um, is, if that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Um, line 185 is where you would fill in um, how many calendar days this, the um, inspection needs to be done within. And I'm seeing in there from seven to 10 in there. Um, and check with an inspector because some inspectors are super busy right now and they can't get out there for a week. So make sure you got a number in there on 185 for um, that you know you can get the inspection done and also still give yourself a day or two to negotiate. Because this inspection timeline that you're putting on what line 185 covers the inspection and also the negotiations of, the, um, of anything that might be found during that inspection. So um, if you got inspected on the ninth day and all of a sudden you know that the roof's leaking and there's some bad wiring in the house, you're kind of up against the wall trying to get this all handled and dealt with in that last single day. So give yourself the right amount of time um, in there. Um, on a competitive offer, you wanna, you wanna short, shorten up that time period. So if you're a multiple offer, that time period that's on 185 should be no more than seven days and make sure your inspector can get it done within that time period. If you're not in a multiple offer situation, 10 is the typical time frame in there. If you have something that pumps up during the inspection, let's say you got a foundation issue or something like that that needs to be investigated by a contractor, everybody can always sign an amendment that would extend this uh, inspection period. So it's not a drop dead date that is written in stone, got everything done. People can both parties can agree to extend that um, period if, if so desired. If something comes up where you need to get some estimates and you can't get them for three, four days, that, that period can be ex extended. And if you can't come to an agreement on who's going to pay for the repairs or, how, or if a price change is going to be done be, based on those inspection items that pop up, make sure you get a cancellation of purchase agreement signed within that period with, that you put in on 185. Because if it goes beyond that 180, that date, 10 days up there, and you haven't come to an agreement or haven't canceled it, your buyer's accepting that house as is. So um, make sure you just adhere to that timeline very closely. And then under 194, 
I've started doing this because I had a seller a couple of years back tell me that a radon test in, um, and, a sept or in a, um, and a sewer scope is intrusive testing. And they would not let my buyer do a sewer scope on the house. So I write in here on line 194, seller allows buyer to perform a radon test and a sewer scope on the home if they so choose. Give, put that in there so the buyer, so the seller cannot deny you of that. I went around and around on that for a week with somebody and my buyers ended up finally just saying, they're hiding something, I'm out of here. And they canceled the transaction since they couldn't do a sewer scope. But write it in there, I'm seeing that becoming more and more common. Um, if, you, if your buyer really wants to do that radon and sewer scope, make sure you write it in there. Any questions so far? Nope. All right, I had lots of caffeine, so if I go too fast, let me know. Um, sale, of, sale of buyer's property here, okay? Um, this purchase agreement, line, or the first box, this purchase agreement is subject to an addendum for the sale of the buyer's property. That will need to include, if you check that box, that means the seller's property or the buyer's property is on the market or going to be on the market and hasn't sold yet. So that's where you would use that box right there. Um, and you would need to include the addendum for the contingency of the sale of the house. Um, two, this is where the buyer's house has sold, but is waiting to close. And so um, the purchase agreement is subject to the successful closing of that property. So that you use that in a situation where the buyer has to have the proceeds from the sale of their house to be able to perform on the next one. So that's how that paragraph applies to a purchase agreement. It just protects the buyer that if the sale falls apart on their current home, they aren't going to lose their earnest money on the house they're trying to buy. That's the protection that that line uh, number two gives the buyer there. And then number three, if they're non-contingent, their house is sold or they're a cash buyer and they don't need to sell their house, you would use line three here, letting the seller know that they are non-contingent. There's nothing holding up this sale besides their financing. So that's what line three is. All right, to go back. So just in checking that one of those three must be signed or checked ticked. And number Correct. three can also be for first time buyers. You know, yeah, they, first time buyer, yeah. somebody who doesn't have a house to sell to be able to perform on the next house. And then which one, this always got me caught up, which one, one or two is required, you know, I remember um, Danielle sending messages back to agents saying we need to get the addendum, maybe that's the first one, that it's, that everything's okay now, you know, um, what, what, which one, the first one needs an addendum? The first one would need an addendum, so when you're, when your seller sold his property, or when your buyer sold their property, then they would furnish an amendment to the seller, letting them know that the contingency on the home sale is removed. Okay, and that's so, what it is. Okay. Yep. Great. But uh, if you if when you do fill out that amendment, say that we are removing the contingency on the sale of the buyer's property, um, this purchase agreement is subject to the successful closing of the home listed at one two three Oak Street. You'd still want to kind of incorporate number two. Yes. into your amendment, removing the contingency in number one, just to cover your buyer's butts in case the transaction doesn't um, come together. Okay, and, to, and if you do use number one and you do use that addendum for the sale of the buyer's property, please understand that the, it, the even if you got the house sold, it's still not a valid purchase agreement to remove this contingency until the inspection is done. So when you get a purchase agreement on the backup property, it's not a valid purchase agreement to remove the contingency on the property they're trying to buy until there's only the financing contingency left. That's how that reads. So if you, it's still contingent upon the financing, but it can't be contingent upon an inspection or anything else but financing. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, real estate taxes. Most typical here, we check the box that says we prorate the taxes to the date of closing. Very common. Um, that's probably 99% of the way that the purchase agreements are written. 
occasionally you might have check one of these other boxes if there's going to be land being divided then all the taxes have to get paid before that land can be divided those are some of just the little stuff you run into over the years that you know but most of the time you're going to check these first two boxes here and then line 221 deals with homesteading and the um you can look on the tax records to find out if it's homesteaded or not but um you can always i 99 percent of the time i check the box here the seller shall pay the difference between homestead and non-homestead even if you know it's a homesteaded property you still check this first box here um, if it's going to be a rental property that somebody's buying and they're continuing to be a rental property you would probably check the second box here since everybody knows it's going to remain non-homestead you would check the second box and just leave it as investment property or non-homestead property okay down here under deferred taxes and special assessments, if you're working for the buyer, you're checking all the boxes that say seller shall pay. Seller shall pay on the date of closing all deferred real estate taxes. So if there's any taxes that are due and owed on that property, seller's paying for them. It makes pretty much sense to me. You know, if a, a buyer should only be paying for the property taxes from the day they own it going forward. So it makes pretty, to me, that makes sense. Um, occasionally, we'll go the other direction, but very rarely. I've probably done it a handful of times in 30 years, so um, uh, probably not going to be using it. The, the other part here, seller shall pay on the date of taxing all installments of special assessments certified for payment. And so when you have an assessment on the property, maybe it's a, let's just say it's a $10,000 assessment. It's being paid off over 10 years there's $5,000 left on it and the payment for this year is $1,000. That's what we're dealing with right here is the payment that is due for special assessments this year. Um, we, the seller should pay for that. Um, it's typical, it was work done when the, house, when the seller owned the house and so they should be paying for it. Um, some sellers or some, um, yeah, some sellers believe that no, it's not my benefit. It's going to be the buyer's benefit. They should take that over. So if you're ever negotiating a deal, and I've seen a few people listing that recently, when there's been a road work done in the last year or two, is that the buyer is going to be assuming the rest of the road improvement assessment. I've been seeing I've been seeing that in agent remarks lately, is that they want the buyer to take over that payment. So um, that's where that's where you would use the first box. Um, the line 233 is here's how do we deal with the rest of that assessment. So in my, in my example before, there's still $4,000 left on that assessment over the next four years. Who's going to pay for that? 90% of the time, the seller pays those assessments off at closing. That's but occasionally the buyer assumes it. But if the buyer assumes it, they also need to be able to qualify with that special assessment payment. In, in their qualifications. So if the buyer is ever assuming the rest of a special assessment, make sure that they, they still do qualify for the house if they accept that. All right, line 235 talks about, it, it would apply kind of this time of year in Minnesota, is right now cities and counties are talking about road improvements that they're gonna do in 2021. And they may vote this fall to say, you know what, we're going to replace all the roads in this one neighborhood and everybody's going to be assessed $5,000 next spring. That's a pending assessment. It's been voted in. It's going to happen and it's improvements that somebody needs to pay for. This is the one that becomes a real stickler to sellers. Sellers go, well, I'm, I'm not going to get any benefit from this. I'm not paying it. And so this is the one where you get a little bit more negotiation happens on line 235 here where it's an upcoming assessment. It hasn't been done yet. So um, again, my feeling is during the, the seller owned the property during the time that that special assessment was voted in, they should be paying for it. So that's how I fill these out. My purchase agreements have seller pay, seller shall provide for payment on every one of them um, most of the time. I should say 99% of the time. So what happens is if there's an assessment that hasn't, they don't know the exact number yet, uh, it's a pending assessment, what will happen for your seller 
is they will take two times the estimated amount of that assessment. So if in my scenario where that $5,000 assessment's coming up, they're gonna take $10,000 from the seller and hold it at the buyer's lender's title company. And when that assessment bill finally comes in, so let's say it's $5,500, they will pay the $5,500 out of the, uh, out of the um, escrow and the other $4,500 will go back to the seller. So advise your sellers that sometimes if there's not a dollar amount that, that they know they have to pay today, they may be escrowing two times of that. And if they need money for their next closing, that $5,000 can make a big difference if, if the bank is holding on to $5,000 of their money for six months till the, till the project is completed. So that's how that can, that can play into a scenario for a seller or a buyer is that sometimes they don't get their, all their money that they need right at closing. Happens very few times, but it, I have had it in my years of doing it, it does come up. And then it just says here, any unpaid special assessments after the year of closing will be the responsibility of the buyer. So just let your buyer know that anything that's not paid for by closing or at closing is now their responsibility. Um, lines 241 through 250 here talk about, again, this time of year, the seller is going to get a letter first saying that there's a new improvement that might be assessed against the property. Here's where the seller is. Um, is representing they have or have not received that notice. So it's just letting the buyer be aware of what might be up and coming. Now, if we got an ex closing that's out 60 days and all of a sudden the seller receives a letter saying, hey, your roads are gonna replace next year, they need to notify the buyer immediately of that situation. And they need to negotiate who's gonna pay for that. So if it's going to be the buyer assuming it, the seller paying for it, or a 50-50 split of it, whatever, we need to come up with um, a way to deal with that brand new assessment that's happening. And if we can't come to an agreement on how that's going to be dealt with, then the purchase agreement becomes null and void, and the buyer walks away from the deal and doesn't have to pay for it. So that's what um, that's how that situation is dealt with. So if you can't come to a decision of who's going to pay for this, then the parties can elect to declare the purchase agreement canceled and move on to a new buyer. Okay. Uh, any questions? Just please stop me if there are. Um, here, how am I doing on time? I got 15 minutes to try to get through the rest of this. Um, additional uh, provisions. Uh, previously executed a purchase agreement. Um, this would be a situation where, let's say, a house was on a market. Uh, or it was off the market, all of a sudden came back on the market, you showed it to your buyer right away and they loved it and they want to write an offer. You want to make sure that that previous offer is canceled and out of the way. If it is not, if they're still going through the mechanics of getting the paperwork passed around, this is where you would use this and say this purchase agreement is, is subject to the cancellation of the purchase agreement that was written on um, October 31st. And it can, and then it needs to be canceled no later than, let's say, given today's date, we'd say we want it canceled by 11, 12, no later than that date. So you set the parameters up there to where it's going to be, um, where it's going to be canceled, because you don't want your buyer sitting there waiting weeks or months for this per first purchase agreement to be canceled, and it never happens. So those are why those deadlines and those dates are in there, is so that people aren't waiting forever. And make sure you always get, if you're in a situation like that and representing the buyer, make sure you always get a copy of the cancellation, just so that you know that it is done, uh, that, that listing agent should prov provide that to you. How often does that happen? Um, not very, but like right now, I had one, one of my listings fell apart under um, a, um, from the inspection. And I put the house right back on the market on Monday morning, and I just received the cancellation today. So if we had if we had sold the house right away on Monday, I would have had it. I would have had to make it subject to the receiving the cancellation. Okay. So it does it does pop up in there. It's it's, it's more mechanics typically or time frames of getting papers shuffled around for signatures, but that's that's how that situation would apply. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, down here under marketable deed. Um, warranty deed, 90% of the time, you're going to check that. 
pox. Uh, that's the most common way to deal with transferring title. Warranty deed is back to your classes. You're handing them all the rights to the property um, of the, of the, um, for the title. Personal representative deed. This is if you know you're purchasing an estate where the kids are now signing on, on behalf of mom and dad, um, they are the executor of the estate. This is where you would check that box because the, the deed is not going to be coming from the seller or the current owner. It's going to be coming from the personal representative of the um, of the of the of the trust or not of the trust, excuse me, of the um, estate. So um, that situation, um, you'll probably know from the, the, the most listing agents will put that in the purchase in the um, MLS that please check personal representatives deed. So if you ever see that in there, you're dealing with an estate where somebody passed away and now you're dealing with the, deal, uh, the estate. And if you're representing a seller's estate, so the, the family has contacted you to sell the, the parents' homes, you want to make sure that you're getting this box personal representative deed checked instead of warranty deed. Um, that's, it makes a big difference and you're going to have to correct it at some point before closing anyways. Uh, contract for deed, that's very seldom or very rarely used, I should say, um, because not, we don't do that many contract for deeds. But if you're doing contract for deed financing, you would check the contract for deed box. And then trustees deed, this I'm seeing more and more often is the title of the property is held by a trustee. So um, the people are still living in the house, but they put the house into a trust to protect it from taxes or whatever the reason they did it. If you see when you pull up the tax records for the property you're writing a title or writing an offer on and it says trustees or anything about trustees, you're dealing with a trustees deed. Uh, same thing if you're listing a property for sale and you, you should always ask the seller if this is held individually or if it's held in a trust. And if it's held in a trust, then you're going to be transferring the title to the new buyer by a trustee's deed. And that trustee's deed normally needs to be drafted by the seller's uh, attorney. The person who put together that deed or that trust needs to provide, provide you the deed to take it out of the trust because there's some special wording and stuff that's always um, accompanied there. Okay, so every deed in Minnesota is subject to these items right here. Building and zoning laws, so whatever the city or state or county says you can do to the property. Um, restrictions related to improvements, again, you know, what you can do to improve that property, that it can be built a shopping center, or it can be only be built single family homes that it, the zoning requirements is kind of what they're talking about there. Reservational mineral rights. So the state of Minnesota owns the gold under your house, if there is gold under your house. Um, that is a weird one, um, but I guess you would charge them a lot to dig up the gold out of your yard if you if they do own the gold underneath, so you'll still make money on it. But that's, that's one that just, that one makes it a head scratcher to me. I've never figured that out, why you don't own everything underneath your house. And then utility and drainage easements, which do not ex um, interfere with existing improvements. So typically power lines, gas lines, those type of things are utility and drainage easements. And then E here would be rights of tenants. So if you're selling a duplex or if your buyer's buying a duplex, you may need to, um, you'll, you'll probably need to write in there uh, the rights of the tenants um, as listed in the, um, rental agreement or the whatever, however the whatever situation they have as far as the type of contract between the renter and the landlord, it's going to have to be subject to those rights. So if you're ever selling one, make sure your buyer knows that the rights of the tenants will continue past the closing date on that transaction. Make sense to everybody? All right, possession of the property, um, always check immediately after closing unless there's some special circumstances. I had an attorney many, many years ago said, I'm not, I won't sign the purchase agreement unless the, I get the property immediately after closing. He said, because I am liable the moment I sign those papers, the house is mine. And if somebody gets hurt on that property, I'm going to be sued. So he said, I will never let anybody in my house after we have closed. 
And so that's why I check box 272 all the time, unless there's going to be a rent back type of agreement or something like that to make the deal to get together. But that ever since that gentleman explained that to me that I don't want to be liable for somebody moving out and twisting their ankle as they're moving out. He said, that's why I checked that box. So we'll leave it at that. Link devices here, those are thermostats that are controlled by your, your phone, um, garage door openers, all of those things. The seller is just gonna be warranting that they're gonna disconnect all of those connections um, at closing or prior to closing. So that's what Link's devices talks about. Prorations talks about um, association dues, rents, uh, charges for, uh, anything that might be associated with the property that's going to, they're going to be prorated to the date of closing. And a big one here is um, buyer shall pay seller for remaining gallons of fuel oil or liquid petroleum gas on the date of closing. This is a real interesting one because um, you don't run into too many propane tanks or uh, petroleum fuel oil heating systems. You'll, you'll run into them out more out in the country and um, out of the city. I did, I do have one in Oakdale right now. The house is heated by propane. And so we have to make a proration at closing for the number of gallons that are left in that, um, that tank. And so how we do that is we say it's a 200 gallon tank. It's a quarter full. There's 50 gallons in it. The current rate of um, petroleum is $2 um, a gallon. So the buyer now owes them $100 at closing for the rest of the petroleum that's left in that tank. That's how that works. So you'll, again, 10 times in my life have I used that proration for petroleum. But if you're, if you're dealing with more rural properties, you're going to uh, see that more often. Title and examination. Um, what I say to buyers in that situation is that your title company is gonna be doing a title exam on this property. Um, and to find out if there's any encumbrances or any liens that need to be dealt with at closing. And the real big thing in here is it, it says the seller is going to provide an abstract. That doesn't happen anymore. The seller is going to provide a copy of any owner's title insurance policy. It just doesn't happen. It used to 20 years ago, but today it just doesn't happen. What happens is the title company for the buyer does a does a title search, does a title commitment, you review that. And if there's any title defect in there, then you have to work to correct it. The big thing down here is in, to, to, you need to explain to your buyer or seller is that 294 through 300 says in here that if the seller cannot make the title marketable by the closing date, the seller shall have an automatic 30 days to could try to fix that. So your closing date, if there's a title problem, gets automatically extended 30 days to correct that problem. And so just make people aware that if, if it pops up, there could be a delay and you're still obligated to this purchase agreement as written. Once it goes past that extended closing date, then the um, if there's no agreement to extend it further, then the purchase agree agreement can be canceled by either party and then a cancellation is to be signed. But that's just a little thing to, to know there um, that if there's a title issue, it might go past your closing automatically without anybody's um, decision on that whatsoever. Again, I run into two title issues in 30 years of doing this. So it doesn't come up very often, but you wanna point that out to both parties that there could be some extension to the closing date potentially. Um, subdivision of land and boundaries. Um, what this says, if the, if prop, if the property is going to be subdivided, that every, all the subdivision paperwork, governmental approvals and everything needs to be paid for by the seller. And that description, there's going to be a new legal description for it. That rarely happens. I've, again, I've never dealt with subdividing land, um, except for two times in my career of doing this. But the one big thing here is that I always point out here is the seller that the last two lines here, seller warrants that the buildings are um, constructed entirely within the boundary lines of the property. And the seller warrants that there's a right of access to the property from a public right of way. That's the important part of this paragraph in my opinion is that the seller is now warranting things about the property that have to be true 
Okay. So this guarantees that your buyer can get to their property um, from a public street. Mechanics liens, that deals with um, any work that's done to the property within the last 120 days. If the seller does not pay for that um, work, materials, labor, whatever supplies, the contractor has the right to lien the property. And there's some very specific leaning, lien rules that have to be followed for people to do that. But what here is, it's guaranteeing to your buyer that if, the, if there is an unpaid lien, the seller is responsible for that. So if something does come back on mechanics liens, your buyer is protected on that. Um, so that's what that part talks about. Um, notices here, this is where the seller um, is warranting that they've not received the notice for a governmental authority that there's condemnation proceedings that they got to tear down the house that there's any violation of laws or order regulations. So basically what that says is the buyer gets to go in there and use the property as the seller is currently using it. So if they're raising pigs there and you're expecting to raise pigs after closing, the seller needs to notify you if that's an illegal activity um, on the property. So that's kind of how that applies. Dimensions, um, just point out to your buyer not to go order their carpet based on the MLS dimensions. Their carpet won't fit. And that's that was what explained to me why this paragraph came into our purchase agreement is that somebody took the MLS dimensions, went and ordered carpet, it didn't fit and they sued their realtor. So now this paragraph has to be in there to cover our butts. So just, yeah, and everything as far as the land, just let them know that it's approximate and it's not exactly perfect. Um, here, this is more of a seller thing that the seller allows access to the property for surveys or inspections that they're agreeing to that. Uh, risk of loss here, um, oops, I locked up. Risk of loss talks about if the property was to be um, damaged before closing, substantially damaged. That's the big key there. Um, so in every guess, everybody's idea of substantial is different, but if there was a flood in the house um, and it needs to be repaired, you need to let the buyer know that right away. Um, the buyer has the option to continue the sale or cancel the sale if, um, if they so desired um, on that, because um, maybe the, your buyer can't wait. Uh, 60 days for the house to get repaired. They're, they gotta be someplace. So a buyer may cancel out on this um, and it is always the buyer's option. I did, in my long years of doing this, I did have one seller that wanted to add the seller or the buyer has the option to cancel this transaction. And the reason was, is the, if the seller had a situation where their house burned and they wanted to just sell a lot and walk away but because they didn't have the option to do that, the buyer got a brand new house for $300,000 um, out of the deal. And the seller would have just liked to have been walked away and been done with it, but he had to wait around six months for the house to get rebuilt and then sell it a brand new house for $300,000 to somebody that was worth a whole lot more money. So that's kind of how that applies. Time of the essence, um, that just means that the dates and the timelines in, the, in this purchase agreement need to be adhered to inspection dates, mortgage approval dates, those type of things. Calculation of days, this just explains what business days are and calendar days are. So business days are Monday through Friday, um, and then calendar days are every other day of the, of the month or all days of the month. So some things are calculated on business days um, as far as like addendums, the, like the inspection, that's calendar days. Um, I think the I think the addendum for selling your house might be business days. So um, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and read that. So just clarifying to buyers because there was always sometimes a discussion of what is a business day or calendar day and is it a federal holiday? And then when does that time period start? So the, the like, let's say a purchase agreement is signed today, but that counter offer goes back and forth and it's finally signed on the 11th. That is the day that it was signed. Day one is the next day after everything is signed. 
So it's, it just clarified because we did, we always had discussions is day one when everything is signed or is day one the day after it's signed. This clarifies here that it begins the first day following the occurrence. So following everything being signed. That's the big thing you got to know about days right there. Release of earnest money. This is also an important one here. And I'm, I see I'm over time, but I'll try to hurry. Um, there's only four ways to release earnest money. Again, used to be a battle between buyers and settle, sellers sometimes that I get my earnest money back because I can't perform. Well, if that doesn't automatically happen. You need to have a written cancellation. And to, to just it, the written cancellation says buyer gets the money, seller gets the money, you're split in 50 50. Um, or you can um, earnest money is released by court order, basically C and D or court order. Uh, a is perfect at closing. We all like that when earnest money gets released at closing. But just let people know that it just doesn't automatically get their earnest money back because they want to cancel the transaction. Sometimes there's sticking points on that. Default, I'll tell you what I tell my, my clients. I said, if the buyer makes good on everything of their loan and they decide to change their mind, the seller may be um, entitled to the earnest money as liquidated damages. And if the buyer is all good to go and the seller says, I don't want to sell any longer, they can sue the buyer or the seller to perform on this contract as written. So if they take legal actions, if there is a default that happens, you don't want to get into that situation. But if you ever do, then you tell your client to contact an attorney um, and, get, and get the good information there. Um, predatory offenders, um, uh, pretty self-explanatory, send them, send them to these two sites or this, these places for the information. Do not say, Hey, um, this is a real good site to find out predatory fam offenders. I used to send people to familywatchdog.org. There was a pretty good site, but I recently learned now I'm taking the responsibility that watchdogs information is correct. It's safer to send them right to these two spots, spots that the realtors have said are good spots and let them check out predatory offenders there. Don't offer up any recommendations of your own. Um, walk through the property, just let your buyer know that they have a right to walk through the property prior to closing. And then here we check under 361, 362, if you've received the seller's disclosure statement or if you've got the disclosure alternative. You just check that so everybody knows and then point out to everybody that the buyer is not relying on any oral representations regarding the condition of the property that you are relying on these disclosure statements. Make sure they are they're aware of that. That's the only description of the property that's going to be enforceable in court. Um, down here, check if it's connected to city water and city sewer. If it is not, you're going to want to check line 381 down here and include an addendum that deals with who's going to pay for the testing of the water, uh, well water and testing of the septic system. So that's, that's what that applies there. That's the big thing that you want to know there. Home warranty plans. Most time people check line 393 here that there's no home warranty. If not, if there is going to be a home warranty purchased by somebody, um, indicate who's going to pay for it who this is going to be issued by and the cost not to exceed uh, dollar amount. Agency notice, we fill out who's respond or who's representing who in the transaction. I've had some buyer's agents not fill in my information because they don't know what type of an agreement I have with the seller, if it's a facilitator agreement, it's a service agreement. So sometimes you may need to fill in this line if you're representing the seller on your own. Uh, dual agency representation here, um, if it's within our company, it's going to be line 406. If it's outside, if it's a different company, you check 405 and skip the rest of that paragraph. Uh, closing costs, just let the buyers and sellers know that there may be other closing costs that are not included in this purchase agreement that might require them to pay money at closing for, um, for uh, certain items. Settlement statement. In the beginning, when this RESPA and this new um, requirements regarding closing came out, they didn't allow the buyer's title company and the seller's title company to talk to each other as share numbers. 
We've since fixed that with this paragraph right here is that this statement is, is the buyer and seller authorizing both title companies that they can disclose information to each other and facilitate the closing in a better way. Uh, foreign Investment to Real Estate Act here, you want the seller to certify that they are a US citizen. If they are a foreign citizen um, owning property in the United States, your buyer after closing could be potentially subject to a 15% tax on the sale price of the house. The buyer would have to pay it. So make sure if that they check the box way down here in the purchase agreement is or is not a foreign person. If it's checked that they are a foreign person, you want to make sure that that tax gets collected at closing or your buyer could be, re be responsible for it. You'd hate for that to happen. Um, Fully exit purchase agreement means that all parties need to sign this and, and copies need to be delivered to both parties. So when you're trying, when you're going through the mechanics of putting a purchase agreement together, don't sit on it. If it's all signed by your party and it's all complete, get it over to the other agent right away, deliver it because that is your contract is not finished until you deliver a copy to that other agent. Um, they could have a chance to back out of it um, if you haven't delivered it yet. Electronic signatures, just everybody's agreeing that that um, electronic signatures are valid. Entire agreement means all the pages, all the addendums and things like that make up the whole agreement and it must be modified in writing by both parties. Um, survival of, um, there's only a few things here that, that survive after the transfer of the deed, but there's warranties about public right of access and some of those things that are in the purchase agreement that will survive the transfer. And then the date of this purchase agreement is defined as the date on line one. So whenever you're amending the contract or adding to it, you'll always go back to the date that's on page one of the purchase agreement and say, this is an amendment to the purchase agreement dated November 10th, 2020. So that's how you deal with that. Other, here's where you could write in any other stuff. So like if you're dealing with a home, um, a relative and they're buying or selling, this is where you'd write in that the agent is related to the buyer or seller. Um, you could write in special terms about maybe some things that the seller is going to do to, to the house before closing. Uh, those type of things might be included in this section here or an addendum is another way to do that. And then down here, you just check what's gonna be included. So if you do have an addendum where it has some extra, extra terms, about the purchase agreement, what the seller is going to do or what the seller is going to perform before closing, you check that box. <coughs> if you're doing an assumption financing or contract for deed, you'll need to do those addendums. The most common one that we use is the lead based paint one. Where's the lead based paint? Set down a little more. But that one right here, I go. That one is checked for the older homes built before 78. And then the other one contingency we see a lot is the addendum for the surface, uh, for the septic system and the well contingency. Those are the big ones that we see used or most common ones. And I guess number 476, the addendum to the um, common to the common ownership of um, or HOAs basically. So I didn't have time to get to those um, addendums. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to explain how those addendums work and facilitate, but are there any questions out there? Chris, Sean? Thanks, Rob. No, thanks, Sean. And Chris, thanks for checking in. Yeah. It... Oop, Megan, you're muted. There we go. My screen keeps jumping everywhere. It was great. It was really great. I learned some things that I had didn't know already. So I appreciate that. That was fantastic. Thank Rob, you. you always do a great job. He's my go to if there's ever a question of some weird circumstance. He's the guy. <laughs> all right. Well, awesome. awesome. I guess I, I guess I've been around long enough to know to, or to run into all these different circumstances. So right? happy right. to help. Okay, well, that's great. Rob, we'll talk later about maybe doing something on, on the 8th. Um, I thought this was really useful. So I might, you know, try to get some more new agents to come on board or even some that have come on board in the past two years, you know, that are still working on getting this, uh, getting this information down because it's complicated if you haven't done it a lot. So yep. 
Okay. All right. Thanks. And um, I appreciate it. See you soon. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.